Hi everyone, my name is Adi and if you haven't heard, the international challenge that qualifies you for the Players' Cup 2 starts tomorrow and is in Series 5 format. Now, if you haven't touched Series 5 in a while, I don't blame you, so today I'm going to go over the top 5 teams in the Series 5 metagame with a detailed breakdown of what their game plans are and how to beat them. Also, if we ever do go back to Series 5 for a tournament like the World Cup, for example, this will be a great guide on what to learn and what type of teams to use, as well as how to play the format. So let's get into it. So first off, we have some honorable mentions. You should probably be aware of these teams, but they aren't the metagame defining threats that the other teams on this list are. These honorable mentions are Porygon Z team, such as Jsuk's team, Drake's ult team, such as Roxxon's team, and the Lapras Comfy Gudra teams, such as my own. Also like whatever Wolf has been streaming with in the last couple weeks, like let's be real, that's 90% of what you're going to face in this IC. Coming in at number 5, we have Cinderace teams. We haven't really seen one dominant build of Cinderace, but if you don't have your answers to this, you will get run over by it. Some examples of this include the team that Chris Khan used to get top 6 in the Players' Cup, the team that Ben Madigan used to qualify for the Players' Cup, and the three teams on screen that got the top 16 in the North American Players' Cup, two of which have reports on this channel. Cinderace teams almost always want to max the Cinderace. They use Cinderace's strong, stab-boosted max moves to pick up KOs, as well as give other powerful attackers the boost they need to clean up whatever Cinderace leaves behind. Cinderace has a wide move pool, but the common moves it clicks are Max Airstream to boost speed, Knuckle to boost attack, or Steel Spike to boost defense. Cinderace's partners are normally chosen to beat the thing Cinderace can't, so your strategy should be adaptable enough to handle an annoying Cinderace partner. The primary counterplay most teams have to Cinderace is Intimidate, but it can mitigate the physical attack drops with Max Knuckle. That is its weakest Max move, and it also leaves it weak to opposing Max Airstream, so that's not the worst thing to do. Incineroar specifically often carry Birdie Jealousy to burn a Cinderace that goes for a boosting move, such as Max Knuckle. On some teams, we also see Torpole run that move as well. It's not surprising that Cinderace is often paired with a Water type, or a Rock type, or Intimidate counterplay such as Milotic or Braviary to help beat Incineroar specifically. Similarly, if you can force the Cinderace out with Yawn or an Eject button, you've slowed the team down considerably. Cinderace also tends to rely on moving first, so Priority Tailwind as well as Trick Room can put a damper on their plans. Excadrill in the Sand can also move before it and hit it with either a super effective max ground before it changes type, or hit the partner with a max steel spike to start tanking Cinderace's hits. Finally, one big reason why Cinderace has fallen out of favor is that it can't really hit Colossal effectively, and so Cinderace teams have to find other ways to play around that. At number 4, we have everyone's favorite Series 4 archetype, Ted. Ted stands for Togekiss, Excadrill, Dragapult, and in the past was paired with Incineroar, Rotom Wash, and Tyranitar. Players dropped one of these Pokemon for Amoongus and kept the rest largely the same. With double redirection, the Dragapult has ample chances to boost up with Dragon Dance or the Excadrill can boost up with Swords Dance before powering through opposing teams. This core thrives on its flexibility. Depending on the sets, four different Pokemon could Dynamax, while all but the Dragapult operate just as well, even without maxing. This allows the team to put on a ton of offensive pressure initially, forcing you into Dynamaxing prematurely, and then punishing that with safe defensive switches, defense boosts, redirection, protect, and sleeping moves. If you don't exert offensive pressure, they can set up their attackers and power through your team. This is one of the most well-rounded archetypes of Series 5. While it sounds easy to set up, the team's reliance on redirection forces it to play very carefully around fake-out pressure. Rillaboom and Incineroar defensive cores lead to positioning heavy games and can allow you to conserve your Dynamax and leverage the Pokemon that can do damage effectively. Against the Tyranitar version of the team, bulky waters such as Primarina can also give it issues if you can deal with the Amoongus. Corviknight is also an issue for versions without their Rotom. If you do opt to run the Rotom, you tend to leave the Excadrill mode a little weaker, and so Charizard and Cinderace matchups are a lot trickier for that version. On a broader note, the team relies on each part for specific jobs, so if you can prioritize KOing the right Pokemon, you can often play to a winning endgame. For example, once you take out the Togekiss and both players have Dynamaxed, Urshifu can very easily clean up the game against this team. Similarly, Ferrothorn can often clean up once all of their special fire moves are gone. The third best team of this format is the one that won the Players' Cup. It's Santino's Colossal Team. I analyzed Santi's Colossal Team in my Top Team Testing Series, so if you want a 14 minute breakdown of its strengths and weaknesses, you should check that out. This team uses Colossal as both a sweeper, 
as well as a Pokemon that sets up massive amounts of passive chip damage to help powerful endgame Pokemon like Rillaboom and Urshifu clean up. The defensive core of Rillaboom, Incineroar, Togekiss, and Breaking Swipe Dragapult can halt offensive teams in their track and let Choice Band boosted Grassy Glides take KOs in the endgame. The defensive synergy also allows them to reposition the Colossal for later in the game if need be. Finally, they still have the option to Dynamax Dragapult if they really need to. Despite the undefeated showing in Players' Cup, the team does have some weaknesses. The biggest weakness is late game or Dynamax Togekiss as both your endgame mods struggle against it and Colossal can't hit it super effectively once its Dynamax is over. If you can deal with Colossal without sacking your Togekiss' redirection fodder, you're often in a great spot. The team also struggles with late game Amoongus in a similar way, but Rillaboom can often ignore it and KO his partners if you don't have Pollen Puff or Sludge Bomb. Another effective game plan for bulkier teams is to set up Trick Room, meaning the Colossal is either moving last if it gets its boost, or not hitting very hard if it doesn't. However, this really only works if you can afford to take attacks from a Choice Bait in Rillaboom, which has priority and doesn't really care about Trick Room. Finally, it's not hard for you to turn the game into one big 50-50 on turn 1 if you're willing to opt into it by leaving two things that can KO Colossal and just maxing one of them. In the number 2 slot is Sun. Sun almost always has Venusaur, Torkoal, and Togekiss on it, with the last three slots varying. Their primary game plan tends to be to max the Venusaur or Charizard, which not only do incredible damage, but also do 1-6 chip damage at the end of each turn thanks to G-Max Vinelash or Wildfire. This amount is marginal to other Dynamax Pokemon, but quickly wears down your normal Pokemon for endgame sweepers like Urshifu, Torkoal, or Tyranitar to clean up. Torkoal are often bulky with Yawn or Burning Jealousy to punish you for Dynamaxing in response to that move. They often also have a weakness policy abuser to utilize Trick Room, which is normally Tyranitar but in Katesha's case was an Incineroar. If they're ever in a bad spot, they can also rely on Sleep Powder from Venusaur to shut a Pokemon down. This team is so difficult to play against because the chip damage punishes you for playing passively, while Torkoal, Venusaur, and Trick Room can punish you for playing aggressively. Sun requires a well thought out game plan to beat, and even those can be foiled by Sleep Powder. The biggest difficulty Sun has is with Dragapult paired with Redirection. After an Airstream, Dragapult can outspeed Venusaur in the Sun, and the team often lacks super effective ways to damage it. You can also power through the Dusclops with Max Phantasm so they can't set up Trick Room. Togekiss, Incineroar, and Arcanine are all hit super effectively by Venusaur and can get powered through, but by forcing Venusaur not to click the Vine Lash and pressuring it themselves, they are often individual parts of a functional Sun game plan. Arcanine is especially annoying for the team since it outspeed Venusaur unless they set up Sun for you and can often run an item to avoid getting put to sleep. The frustrating part is that otherwise solid game plans can get foiled by Sleep Powder, so Safety Goggles or Lumberry on a Pokemon that's good against Sun can be effective counterplay if you're already in a good position. Finally, if you really want a one Pokemon answer to Sun, there's always Gudra. They can't really beat it if you support it well enough. Finally, the team that I think is the best in the format is the Desu team. It's more broadly classified as the Dragapult, Porygon 2, Firewater, Grass Core, but Desu had the most success with it. He won the Rose Tower Invitational and got third place in the Players' Cup using this team. All these teams play slightly differently, but they all rely on the near unbreakable Firewater Grass Core that was on seven of the top eight Players' Cup teams. They combine this with Porygon 2, who is probably the best damage sponge in the format, and many teams struggle to KO in the late game. Dragapult's ability to force Dynamaxes and poke holes through teams make this very challenging to deal with. The team normally Dynamaxes their Dragapult or Primarina, and if it's Dragapult, they'll usually lead it with Teraki and her Togekiss to help put on pressure. Once they've picked up some KOs, late game Rillaboom can be really hard to stop, or Porygon 2 difficult to KO. They can also stall their Dynamax until the late game on the back of the Firewater Grass Core. Primarina always puts on offensive pressure, and if your Rillaboom isn't KOing it with the Intimidated Grassy Glide, it is probably getting KO'd back by a Max Hailstorm. This team is very difficult to beat. The Ferrothorn version has two potential endgames to play to, and you have to preserve Pokemon that can deal with their bulky Pokemon in the endgame without getting run over earlier. It helps if you can identify their lead. If they go with the more offensive Dragapult mode, you'll need ways to account for both Beat Up as well as Max Phantasm and Rock Slides, whereas against the more balanced mode, you want to be able to pin part of their core. A single, impactful read can also swing the game in your favor. If one leg of the Firewater Grass core goes down, your core can probably beat it if you're healthy enough. However, if they poke a hole in your team first, well, good luck. You'll need to play precisely, identify their endgame, constantly keep your win condition in mind while positioning. However, 
There's one other weakness and it is the bane of Desu's existence. Because piloting this team relies on constant offensive pressure, precise endgames, and doing just enough damage, a well-timed ally switch can often swing the game in your favor. But for the sake of Dave's mental health, please don't do that. So there you go. The five best teams in Series 5 and how to beat them. If you've got other ways you consistently beat these teams, please share it in the comments down below. And if you like this content, make sure to subscribe. I wish you all the best of luck in the Players' Cup. Until next time, I'll see you all later.